All right, so my name is Anna, Anna Bramberg, and I am a uh, predominantly a UI designer, but I do both a bit of UI and UX design. And I work at EA Fire Monkeys in Melbourne. And um, I, I am Swedish originally. I grew up, all right, so my background's a little bit scattered. I grew up in Southern Africa. Um, my family still lives <clears throat> But then I moved to my native Sweden when I was 18 and I studied at uni and I studied graphic design and I wanted to work in, I didn't even know what I wanted to work in. I don't think I, I knew anything at that point. And I started working afterwards at a board game company and I managed to get an incredible job straight out of university <clears throat> as an art director. Um, that was fun, and, but I kind of got bored of print design but I loved working with games and I was tired of Sweden it was cold and dark and I didn't grow up there and I wasn't used to the climate so I thought you know screw this I'm moving to Australia so I moved to Melbourne and I um, kind of tripped and fell into this job uh, they offered me a job here at EA and I was kind of taken aback because I thought I was completely underqualified and under and you know the, the typical imposter syndrome thinking that you're not good enough. but yeah they they offered me the job so I took it of course with both hands and um, I've been here ever since and working with digital games and absolutely love and realizing that no actually I am good at my job and um, having awesome uh, does anyone have any questions before I start asking some you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can ask in text on the Ask Me Anything channel. So I wanted to ask, uh, how, I, you might have said this already, but how many uh, years have you been at your current job? Um, <clears throat> so I've been here for three and a half years now. How many projects have you worked on in that time? Just the one, strangely enough. So I've been on The Sims the entire time. So I work on The Sims Free Play, which is made here in Melbourne. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is all. Um, yeah, I um, I got hired for The Sims, <coughs> and um, yeah, a lot of a lot of people get to move around onto different projects and things. But I have just had my hands full on The Sims. It's been a full time thing, and it's down many. Times soon so um just the same uh and so like what does your what's an example of like your uh day to day like or sometimes people's uh typical day are a little weird so the next best question to ask is what's your typical week look like yeah um i can i can answer that in a sec, it might be easier if I kind of explain what I do first. Sure. And then go through a day-to-day -day kind of or week by week process. So I um, I do a few different things. Um, I'm wondering what the easiest way actually. Sorry, I'm going to take creative liberty with this question. I'm going to answer this in the course of um, a sprint for us, a weekly. So each update that we do here um, is about six weeks and so my job actually kind of evolves <clears throat> as the six weeks of, excuse me <clears throat> so my job actually evolves during the course of the six weeks so i start off um with more of a ux design role and at first we uh, collaborate with the designers and the producers they decide what they want from that particular feature and we create wireframes and prototypes and um, we do clickable prototypes we do some player testing and um, once that has been approved and we know what it is we're going to be doing <clears throat> we then move on to uh, becoming more of a, a ui person and then i do i build the layouts while well, i do um high fidelity mock-ups first of all of these projects. and um we kind of uh, once that's been approved, the appearance has been approved. We 
go into our layout tool and we build the layouts themselves. And once that is all kind of set up, that gets sent off to the coders. And then in the last couple of weeks of the, of the update, we go on. for iteration and polish and so forth. So yeah, during the course of six weeks, I kind of take on three different roles. Does that kind of answer the question? I think I get it. Uh, if, if anyone had, wants to jump in with follow-up questions, feel free. I don't want to hug the mic. <laughs> Hello? I, um, I do have a, Photos on my like Twitter. I think my pinned tweet is a visual representation of what I just spoke about. In case you're interested about Ooh. that. All right. Uh, do you know? Uh, can you describe what you think the difference between UI and UX is? Yes. Uh, since you great. said you work on both. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So UX design is more about. So UX stands for user experience, and that is about exactly what it sounds like. It's how the user experiences your So there's a differentiation between a UX researcher and a UX designer. And we do have a UX researcher in our studio as well. And um, that is, yeah, it's very, that's different to the actual design of the product. He deals with uh, testing and getting the data and the way that players, oh, thanks, you just put that up, thank you. Um, dealing with the way that the players interact with um, our product, and then that gets interpreted into UX design. How do we take that information and manifest that into visual representation? Um, so it's a lot about the user flow through, like how the game progresses from beginning to end. You know, how many clicks does it take for a user to to start? You know, they want to do this one particular thing. How many clicks does it take them to go from start to finish? Or how easy is it to find the information that they need in the app? Where is the button? Where is the character? How do I do what I want to do? And then UI design is about the visual experience. UI meaning user interface. So it's about um, everything on the actual interface. What does it look like? And uh, yeah, it's that's more of a, a visual designer as opposed to an experience. Does that make sense? I think it does. I think that was very helpful. So uh, the the experience is not so bogged down in the nuts and bolts. It's like exactly. the, taking a step back and looking at it as a whole. Exactly, exactly. So when we do our, um, like the, the UX design isn't like, they, you don't need to be a good artist to be a designer. You, it, a lot of the work that we do for that is wireframes and, and um, like prototypes. So it's that sketch that you just, put onto the, um, the chat that is just gray boxes. So it's just boxes with lines and diagrams from one screen to the other. And then in the, um, when you get to the UI role, that's where you can start getting a little bit more creative with your app. So The Sims has, like you said, a lot of UI. How do you manage that? Like, how do you deal with UI design at a large scale. <laughs> yeah, so The Sims has a lot of UI. Um, <laughs> and especially for a mobile game, it's such um, It's been around for six years now, which is a long time for a mobile game. And we didn't initially think it would last this long. Like, we, yeah, we didn't build it originally with the intention of having it be around for six years because no other game had been around for that long. And nowadays there are, you know, you've got your Fruit Ninjas and, and yeah, there's, there's a bunch of really successful, great mobile games around, but we didn't think that a mobile game would last that long at the time. And so a lot of our stuff was created, not really expecting there to be this sheer volume of stuff in the game. So a lot of our challenges today is about retrofitting um, new features and things into an existing system. So while we're creating new features and trying to integrate new things and new content into the game and onto our display, um, it's also about how do we add things without cramming too much? How do we still make it an enjoyable user experience? 
um, so it's not cluttered or confusing. Um, so it's about organizing the existing archaic content in the game and making that more streamlined and modernizing it as well. A lot of the stuff is, you know, was designed originally for the iPhone 3. And so, yeah, when you consider what devices are like today, it's, it's a lot of work to try and organize the old stuff as you create. Oh, so, so you kind of have to, as you add new stuff, make sure you don't accidentally end up with like a Frankenstein design where like yeah. half the product looks one way and the other half looks the other way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but it also sounds like you have to do like kind of redesigns every now and then, like as you yeah. said, to modernize everything. Yeah. So, and the thing is, you don't want to scare your players with this massive visual change. So, a lot of the stuff we've been doing really, really slowly, incrementally, update by. And so, if you were to compare the screens from, you know, say five years ago with what it looks like today, it's completely different. But we can't just suddenly one update just be like, no, this is old, this looks terrible, we're just going to redo the entire thing because it, that would be really confronting. Um, yeah. So you have to be really kind of smooth about it. <clears throat> So you said uh, The Sims was your first digital design job? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. so yeah, um, I kind of had to hit the ground running when I, when I started working here. I didn't know any of the technical aspects of the game, um, which is why I was so surprised when they offered me the job. I wasn't good enough. <laughs> and um, but I obviously I had a I had a skill for shape and form and understanding visual hierarchy, all of that kind of stuff. And then all the technical things they trained me when I got in. I yeah, think they might have seen that as a plus because like. So I, I used to work at Microsoft and I was thrown onto a team that I had never even heard of, like Azure Active Directory. It's this super technical enterprise IT product. But I was repeatedly told that my lack of familiarity with it was one of the things they were looking for. Because if yeah. you are too familiar with it, you get stuck in the same boxes of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And fresh blood is always an asset. Oh, I just got a message from Dave Gibson. Hello from Tokyo. <laughs> hey, Dave, if you want to get onto the um, onto the Discord channel, because I don't want to keep flick. Actually, no, I can do this. I yeah. can just keep So you can, uh, if you want to ask questions, again, reminder, you can unmute yourself and start asking away, or you can type them into the Ask Me Anything channel. Yeah. Hey, Dave, if you want to jump onto the Ask Me Anything channel, just write it here. Or you can write it and I'll just read it out. That's okay too. Oh, he's typing. Yay, success. There's a lot of listeners. <laughs> yeah, we have. I think this is the most we've had so far. Yay. Makes me happy. This is something that I really care about. Like the Maybe. UI and UX is often so um, overlooked and disregarded by the games. And it's really exciting that it's been kind of getting a bit of traction now and people are listening and people are noticing it. And I'll notice when I go to conferences um, that, or I'll go to events or anything, that people always seem to have things for uh, designers and they've got for 3D artists and they've got for coders. But there's not really that much stuff for UI and UX. So it's really nice to finally be um, getting, you know, a bit, of, a bit of noise and a bit of traction. Yeah. yeah uh, um, so you said you've been working on like this one project for like the whole time you've been at EA, which is like three years or so. Three and a half, yeah. Yeah. So, like, regarding that, like, what keeps the project interesting? Because like three years is a long time to be working on one thing. Mm, absolutely. So the the upside of working on The Sims is that because we do six weekly updates. Every update is a complete thing. So we'll go from having like pirate themed stuff, one thing, one update to having primary school stuff and like kindergarten stuff, or then we'll do like pets. So we'll have like puppies and kittens for six weeks. And, you know, there's new themes every six weeks. So for me, that means um, new visual stuff to work on. Okay. So that like keeps it interesting. Um, yeah. 
And it's a challenge as well. Sorry. Hey, go on, sorry. Oh, um, it's a challenge as well to, I guess, so the new themes is what keeps the, the UI part of me excited. And then from a UX point of view, it's always a challenge of every time we want to integrate a new feature, how do we integrate this into this massive game already without overwhelming the players? You know, how do we, it's like constant interest. How do we manage to streamline the old stuff, organize it better, and then integrate stuff into this massive game? And that's fun too. Fair that enough. sounds a lot like programming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, visual well, programming, I guess. I'll let Nathan, Nathan continue. Um, yeah, so a follow-up question regarding the whole new content every six mm -hmm. weeks. I don't know how, like, like, what decisions you're involved in, but, like, do you know if it's difficult to come up with something new every six weeks because like if the game's been running for like three and a half years and it's probably been longer that's just how long you've been there like how yeah. do they keep coming up with new stuff every six weeks that sounds like it would like it sounds like you'd run out of ideas strangely enough we don't um we're really eclectic with the people that work here it's pretty great um a lot of the people who work on the sims aren't the kind of players who would be playing the sims and so it's it's a really diverse group of people and when we have a brainstorm sessions they <laughs> they can sometimes spiral out it's pretty funny. um but we also listen to our players a lot and so if the players have been um asking about things on social media we've got our community managers who are amazing and who we absolutely adore and they are our ear to the ground when it comes to our players and what players want so if lots of players have been screaming about you know uh, more long hair for teenagers or more I don't even know like it is that is the next thing they're talking about now I should mm -hmm. probably be keeping more time about that. but whatever it is that the players are screaming about you know that's what we try within technical restrictions obviously but that's what we try and integrate and we try and satisfy the players that's okay. who we're doing for. <laughs> so thank you that's all all the questions I have at the moment cool okay. thank you because you have to integrate with so much stuff, it sounds like you have to... It sounds like being there for a while might help so that you can be, think, hey, this might conflict with that that I remember from years ago. Yeah, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm still on The Sims is because... Um, so over the course of this many years, so we still have to make the game for two different devices. So we still have an iPhone version of the game. Oh, not iPhone, just phone, sorry. A phone version of the game and a tablet version of the game. Mm -hmm. um, because it was, you know, devices were so different back then. Nowadays, when games are made, you can make one game for everything. But it was, it was designed that way in the beginning, and so that's how it is today. And so we've got, I think I counted the other day, um, it was over 3,000 layouts for just the phone and obviously 3,000 layouts for the tablet as well. So that's over 6,000 layouts to keep tabs on. And so having someone that's been on the game for years means that I know exactly where everything is. I know what things are called. I know where everything's organized and put in our folders and our kind of structures. So yeah, it's really useful to, to have that kind of knowledge of the back game. And, you know, I mean, everyone, everyone can find stuff. It's just... A few of us who have been here longer, we find it easy. Another question in chat. Yeah. Hi, Anna. What's the best way to get involved in the local, particularly Melbourne, game dev community? So, this is great. So, I love, 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 love the Melbourne game dev community. Um, I'd say come out to the events. I know IGDA has um, regular meetups, so the, the Melbourne meetups happen on Tuesdays, I'm pretty sure. Um, not every Tuesday. But yeah, if you keep tabs on their Facebook page, they'll say where they are. They're usually at the Kelvin. Um, come there, come say hi. Um, and come to Bar SK. There's a plug for one of my favorite bars here in Melbourne. It's a game dev bar in uh, run by friends of mine, Louie and Katie. And a lot of the game dev community hang out. Um, come have drinks with us. Or, you know, don't drink. Come have a soft drink with us. Um, just be cool, be nice, network. Don't see people as potential jobs. Um, you definitely want people to see you as a person. And so connect with them. And that way, you know, if you're good, eventually 
people will know about your talent. And if we're looking for someone, we look for our friends and people we get along with on a personal level. So connect with people. And also um, game jams. There is, um, there is regular, I think the global game jam is and there is a game jam for ladies done by Girl Geek Academy. It is, was it the 28th to 29th of April? So in a week, two weeks time. Just get involved in game jams and bring your skill set. You don't need to be amazing. Um, bring your skill set and play. Make games with people. Become friends with people there. And yeah, just get to know people. Be nice. And I can... I can like back up basically everything you're saying. Uh, here, in, I, I live in Seattle, and here there is a very strong games community as well. And I know a bunch of people who, like some are students, some are not, who wish to work in the games industry. And for whatever reason, they just don't go to all of the meetups that are in town. And I feel like they're miss really missing out. And I usually try to convince them to go just because they're fun. I'm like, go because it's fun. And people are like, but I'm not actively trying to get a game job right now. I'm like, no, no, you need to do this before yeah. you, you start looking for a job. Yeah, build, absolutely. Build these networks, build these friendships. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not looking for another job right now either, but I still go to all the things because should the day come when I am, then, you know, I want to have a great network of people that I can reach out to. Yeah, and once you actually make friends, once once you make friends, you're, you'll miss them. And so you want to keep meeting up with them. <laughs> exactly. And I think especially for women and minorities in the community, I think the community is so, you know, white and full of dudes. And so I think it's extremely important to find your little trap. And the, I mean, especially within tech, tech has a hard time of reaching women and minorities in the industry. So find your find that support network that's how you're really going to get involved in the community and that's going to make your work experience so much better. okay we have a few new questions yeah is the sims team still working via post-it notes on whiteboards or have you guys moved into jira hands yet if you are still working via post-it notes can you explain how this system works better than digital uh we do both um i have to say i really love the the kind of tangible thing of of everyone like the entire group that you're working with has a daily scrum meeting everyone stands up by um your physically move your post-its back and forth you can see oh for people maybe i should explain this a little better um for people who don't know so scrum boards are the big white boards or whatever color boards where you you write you draw different columns so you've got your backlog on the very left um in progress uh, oh, what is it like to do or in progress sent off to code which is everything's been completed on our side sent off to code and then polish and then you can put all your tasks onto post-it notes and then everything starts on the very left hand of the column and then as the update progresses you move things across depending on where you are so every morning the team meets up at the scrum board and you move your thing along and it means that you get visibility through the team of um, who's working on what are there any is um, is anyone struggling with anything do they need help and so forth and so i actually enjoy having that moment every day of seeing where the entire team is and it means that we speak to each other and don't just do stuff online and also if stuff is just online you don't you're not forced to look at it and so if you can't see that something is stuck somewhere you don't know that something needs help so mm -hmm. having the entire team up there seeing where people are working is really useful um but we do also work in everything on the scrum board is also on jira so as you work you send tasks along and and um you assign tasks and tasks along do you have like someone whose job it is to keep jira up to date with the physical copy uh so each team lead is the one who sets all that up okay. so the UI lead is the one who I mean I don't know how other teams work I can only speak for my team um, but on my team our UI lead is the one who at the beginning of each update will do all the Jira tasks all the parent tasks and then transfer things onto post-it notes um, actually it's not even post-it notes he's updated from that he just prints them out he prints out little visual colored mm -hmm. cards that, he, um, that we stick up on 
that's a really strong case for doing it non-digitally. And I guess people always want the dig digital version for like archiving reasons and all that. Yeah. And backup. Uh, but, and we have, we have but yeah, the, I think the physical case is kind of not, I don't hear it as often. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, Sorry, but the visibility <laughs> and meeting up with the team and chatting to the team because otherwise there are so many people in the team that you never see. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite a big team. We've got studio. Each team has a lot of people. So, yeah. All right, next question. Hi, Anna. First of all, thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, my question is, are internships offered at Five Monkeys? If so, what would be something? Anything that you can add that would help someone's chances of landing one of those or anything else you'd like to add about it thank you okay so uh yes we do have internships yes they are paid um you can check our website i can post it on i probably on here oh maybe i can do it i can do it here and on my twitter if you like um i can post a link to um to some of our information so our recruiter works pretty tightly with um, a lot of the, um, the universities and, and things here. And we do have a strong internship program. Um, tips for landing one of those. Um, again, that goes back to getting involved in the local community. We who work here will always vouch for people that we know are good people, first and foremost, and then also talented, obviously. Um, so make friends. Um, good people good. as in you can vouch for their character yeah um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. you know they're not you know, <laughs> yeah exactly if you know that someone's like really easy to work with or you know is open to to growth or, or you know handles criticism constructively or you know anything if you know that they're not going to be a right. bad person to work with that is always um and then like i guess for a student as well just um be be aware of the requirements of each job it is that you look at. don't just segment yourself into i know a lot of um courses unfortunately just do coding and three and that's it um, and and while that's great don't get me that's awesome but don't think that that's all the industry has to offer the industry has so 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 much to offer just on our team we've got you know ui people ux designers, UX researchers, we've got development directors, producers, engineers, animators, um, there's community managers, there are so, so, so many different roles that you can do. So just um, find what your niche is, what you're passionate about, get good at that, and then find out what requirements are needed of you within that. Yeah, so read beyond the job title and the job posting, look up the yeah. skills that they're asking for and see if you have them or if you might thrive in that yeah. role. Yeah, absolutely. No worries. Thank you. She just typed thanks into the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, before moving on, I had a follow-up question about... I was just going to say to, to her as well, or him or her, I'm not quite sure. But um, if you see me around, you know, feel free to hit me up and say hi. Yeah. Um, hi. Yay, more women. Um, feel free to hit me up. And, you know, I can put you in touch with any of the, the people we've got in the studio who have had internships and then have gone on to become... Uh, employed by the studio um, or even moved on to other studios that's cool too um, there are some great people who've come through here on an internship program I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with them and they can answer more questions so have you worked with interns yeah absolutely on, on your team yeah yeah they're treated just as everyone else you you're part of the team and <laughs> um, we have incredible interns come through here and and some of them have stayed on and some have moved on to other and some have gone back to the team. And yeah, they've and what I love about interns as well is because they're fresh out of like studying and things, they're so excited and eager. There is a there's a tangible excitement about interns that you don't often get with people who have, you know, been in the industry for 10, 15 years. Um, so it's it's really exciting to come in with people who've got fresh ideas and yeah. So, next question. Hi, Anna. I just finished doing a part and I'm currently working on a design portfolio. What kind of case studies would be good to include into your portfolio if you're applying to the industry? Oh, God. That's, that's a different um, 
find something that is really, I wouldn't say broken, but find something that's difficult to use. And um, there's a couple of there's a couple of apps. I think it depends again if you games industry is so so wide. Are you, are you doing mobile? The two are completely different. Um, if you doing mobile because that's that's what I work. On. <clears throat> find an app, any app. It doesn't need to be. A game. Obviously, it's better if it's a game. But find any app that is uh, difficult to use and read it and use that as a as a for PlayStation. Again, just find something, find a little aspect of it then. Find something that you struggle with or that players struggle with. Do, do, some, um, do some research, do some, uh, uh, what's called like, do some um, questions. Uh, do a question users who struggle with things. Find what people struggle with and see how you can rework that. Again, it's not just about what you personally, I think that's an important thing, just what you personally struggle with. It's about finding an issue in your target audience as a whole. What I want isn't reflective of what the player base wants. And that's an important distinction. Uh, I think, um, so find something that a lot of people struggle with and try to fix that. Is that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? And kind of related to that, how do, you, uh, how do you work with that kind of feedback? Like, do you ever ship something, see user feedback or play test data and be like, okay, that was a bad design. And how do you, how do you, how does that work for you? Yeah, so a lot of our work goes into uh, iteration. So that's why it's important to have, remember how I spoke about before about UX design, about how we work in wireframes and gray boxes and things. So the reason we do that, the reason we don't just jump into making pretty things is because if, if we need to change something, then we've wasted all that on something that's not, good, that's not usable. So the reason we use just boxes and like real basic things things is so that we can quickly sketch out an idea, we make little clickable prototypes, we test it, does it work, does it not work? If it doesn't work, that's fine. We just, you know, it's very easy to redraw and redo. And then we test it again and we iterate and we iterate and we iterate until we've got something that works. Once we have a flow that is functional, that, sorry, I'm reading as I'm answering, <laughs> once we have a work that's functional, that makes it um, and that is easy to that's when we can then start doing the pretty versions of things. And that's when we can start building our layout. So I said, I actually did a survey on HGTV. Surveys are great. Surveys are very useful. Wow, that's sure. pro stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but that's, that's crucial. You should absolutely do it. And that's the that's the thing that us in the studio we we have a UX researcher, so we've got a team of people that do that kind of legwork for us, and we help with um, writing out the like the questions and the screeners for the recruitment. Obviously, they, the UX researcher needs to know what information it is they're looking for, so we all help with that aspect, and then the researcher does all that. Um, and then they will um, kind of take, they'll analyze the data and then they'll bring that data back to us. And then we use that. How many UX designers are on your actual team? So um, we have a UI UX lead who works on the simulation team, who is no longer on the Sims. Um, but she is still my direct like manager, my people manager, and she is kind of my 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 mentor, um, a, the person I go to for advice and things. And we have a um, like my day to day, my work manager lead, and me. And we used to have a few more people, but they've been moved on to because we've obviously 
it's very fluid here in the studio. We've got lots of teams and lots of development. So right now, there's three of us on the simulation. And I think we're constantly finding that we need more. I think, especially within mobile, we're, mobile needs more and more and more. What you are in UX. There's a couple of questions from someone who's not my dad, who he has five different questions. Should I get on to that? Or he says, if you run so, out of questions. Um, uh, if anyone, if anyone wants to jump in now, would be a good time. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, earlier you were talking about how you were making the uh, UI and UX for, uh, adaptable for older players how do you introduce it to newer players do you show everything at once or do you show it bit by bit that's a really good question that we are constantly constantly trying to deal with yeah so we don't want to overwhelm our players <laughs> and so we've actually gone back and try to redo the, the onboarding experience for our new players and the like what we call the first time user experience um, and that is something that we, we regularly go back and think, all right, we need to redo this. We need to redo this just because every time, um, we add new features onto the game, suddenly the game becomes really massive again, and we need to go back and rework the, the basic experience. So yes, we do kind of let the player trickle through things, but then once you reach a particular level, suddenly it's like, wham, you know, everything gets dropped on you at once. And so um, that's one of the things that I care about a lot, about how we can fix the, the beginning experience. So yes, we do trickle it onto the players, but I still think we could do a better job. So that's definitely on something that we're constantly working on. Just the game is huge. <laughs> Sith is typing. Uh, all right, I can jump onto the first question here. Of um, you guys are using Adobe XD for your rapid prototyping still? Or have you moved on to where for service or do you even rapid prototype anymore in some live service? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't actually use Adobe XD. We we have it, and I tried it, and I didn't enjoy it. Uh, we've gone through a couple of different. We've tried a couple of. Um, as someone says sketch and envision different things. I've tried sketch as well and envision. Um, I've struggled with all of them for different reasons. There's no particular tool out there that I find is as user friendly as sketch, but still has all the different um, things that I want to be able to do. So each one of them is super useful in their own way and lack in other ways. Uh, Adobe XD is still in, in development, so hopefully, especially with like the weight of Adobe and the money of Adobe and the research of Adobe behind it, I'm hoping that XD will grow and kind of become a lot better. Uh, but we actually do a lot of our gray boxing in Illustrator, to be honest. Um, and then we um, we use Envision sometimes to do our little clickable prototypes. But the thing is, we have a layout tool that has been developed internally that is really, really good. And because we've got so much content in the game, um, it's really, really easy for us to put things together really quickly inside the layout tool. So we've already got all our existing buttons and, and windows and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I'll use Illustrator to quickly do our gray boxes, um, to do like our big flow diagrams. And then once that's approved, I'll jump straight into our layout tool just because it serves so many things. It serves so many purposes that the other tools don't. And I realize that in mentioning our layout tool, I'll inevitably get questions about our tool. And maybe I should preempt that by just talking about it. Um, I guess uh, uh, sure. it's really useful. It's it's one of the, I think one of the best things about working at our particular studio. Um, one of the things that I think our studio is really proud of as well. Um, in the same way that Frostbite is the engine that's rolled out to 
EA on console worldwide. So our studio has developed the engine for mobile and um, that's being rolled out to EA mobile worldwide. And so this team is the one that developed our layout tool as well. So they kind of go hand in hand um, and it's super useful. It means that we can see the things that we create on all the devices simultaneously. We can quickly, it's like a cross between Adobe Flash or Anime as it's called now and InDesign, I guess. So we can quickly create, animate, and yeah, just make features in the tool straight away. Um, so yeah, so I guess we do, yeah, we do rapid prototyping in sometimes, not really on the Sims anymore. We, I think as well with us, because we know what the game looks like and how features work, we kind of have an idea straight away how things are supposed to, to go. So that bit's relatively straightforward for us. Uh, next question. Are you working in Waterfall or Agile or a mix? How would you ideally like to work and why? So we were originally a bit of a Waterfall kind of structure and we've really, really, really worked, um, moved into Agile lately. Uh, again, scrum boards and uh, more of a flat hierarchy. Um, so yeah, definitely Agile. Agile is my ideal way to work 100%. Um, do you still work with personas in life service? Um, yes, so we do have, I think EA's got their own internal um, segmentation. I think if, yeah, let me know if this is getting described. Great what personas are for people. All right, so personas are different kinds of people that you that you that play your game. So it's someone that um, represents your target audience. So you've got different kinds of personas that represent different kinds of players within your target audience. And um, a UX researcher obviously knows your target audience really well. We've done lots of surveys. We know what our player base is like. So we have um, so while we don't have specific personas per se, like we don't have, you know, Claire is 47 years old and works in marketing. Like we don't have that um, in on the Sims. We have different kind of motivation segmentation. So we've got, you know, um, for people who don't know what the segmentations are, you've got like your strategic players, your creative players, your um, um, narrative players, your uh, achievers, you know. Um, so you've got different kinds of uh, players and what their motivations are. So, um, and on The Sims, for example, you know, The Sims is a, a narrative-based game. It's a creator game. So we definitely have those kinds of, um, like we know that about our players. So while we don't have a strict persona, Claire, 47 years old, like we don't have that, but we do know exactly what our segment is for our target audience. And that That's is cool. definitely useful. So it's more like a game design classification rather than a demographics, like entrepreneurship style kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that means that whenever we struggle with, um, you know, a particular feature, how are we going to bring about a particular feature? You just bring it back to your target audience. You know, how, what is it that our target audience wants? Again, you're not designing, you're not making a game for you, you make it for your players. Uh, there's another couple of questions. Sorry, I'm going to jump down to uh, the other questions. Um, hi, Anna. Thank you for your time. How do you manage or optimize animated UI elements, image sequences, etc., for mobile? What do you believe are the best practices for developing animated UI elements for mobile? All right. Again, so we that kind of ties into a uh, question. We have our internal interfacing and animation tool. Um, we like we build everything in there it's um so we have different images like little um kind of that you can you create svgs that then get rasterized into um tiffs, i think it is or bitmaps or pngs i don't know what the what the engine then converts them to but we create little uh assets that we build into this layout tool and then we move them around. So we've got our keyframes, our timeline, similar to um, Adobe Animate or uh, Maya or whatever. So we've got our little keyframes that we animate through there. Um, 
as for developing what are best practices, best practices for animated UI, um, breathe life into your animations. If you have, if you have something, if you have an, a button, you know, like don't just have a, don't just have a, a button that just sits there, like make, make it interesting. When you click on something, like you want a game to feel, this is going to sound really dumb, but you want a game to feel juicy. Like when you click a button or when you get a reward, you want that. It's like, oh, that felt really good when I clicked that button. So um, make it juicy. But on the other hand, don't do anything, like nothing in excess. Like you don't want too much. You don't want to be overwhelming your player as well. So, so kind of streamline it. Only do effects where it's really it is useful for the player where it gives you like you, you know you want that effect because you want player to feel satisfaction in doing that so reward them for that don't just animate everything and i guess the other thing is consistency be consistent um choose it or lose it <laughs> yeah um absolutely um so be consistent don't have like fifty thousand different kinds of animations and transitions and things like if you have a way that your dialog boxes appear on your screen, you know, do they slide in from the top or do they animate and roll in front of you? Like, be consistent always. If a particular button um, is disabled, if there's a particular way that you show that something is disabled, be consistent. If you have a reward sequence, be consistent in the way that you do that. You know, does it sparkle? Does it glow? Does it have your god rays? Are there angels singing in the background? Whatever it is, be consistent. Because yeah like you want something to feel organized uh, i'm really glad you said what I, i'm really glad that? you said juicy because like uh, the link the, the talk that i just posted on youtube i saw that years ago and i started using the word juicy as like game design jargon and i was always surprised yeah. when i met people who didn't understand that word and i'm like yeah. hey another person who uses that word <laughs> yeah, absolutely. and that's the thing like i love playing games sometimes you see you are like just for the juicy little like things that you can touch and like because it, it makes me feel good when i play the game and that, that kind of is a lot of things that i say as well about being a um like a lot of ux designers about making your players feel things i'll often say that feels you know this and this so i you know that makes me feel like this or you know i feel like this is a good idea because and that's because a lot of it is just intuitive emotional gut responses to things and your brain doesn't always analyze why you like a thing or you don't like a thing you just do instinctively you do and a lot of the work that we do is about making players feel something when they play the game uh, uh, next question game jams faded in games they work i never thought about attending for you i figured the game dev real no you should absolutely come to game jam um Game jams are great. So the I mentored at the Global Game I mentored the She Hacks Games by Girl Geek Academy later this month. Um, they're awesome. And basically, they work by a whole bunch of people of a weekend, and you set aside the entire weekend for that. Some people spend the night, they'll overnight, they'll like completely go all in for these. Some people go home at night, but you spend an entire weekend with group of people so they'll divide you up into teams depending on your skill set so um each team hopefully will have you know a coder a design a um an artist uh, a producer whatever it is so they'll you'll have a varied amount of skills in each team and they'll give you a theme or a topic or any kind of guidance at the very beginning so um the global game jam this year the theme was transmission and then you have an entire weekend to create a game, any kind of game based on that theme. And then at the very end, you can showcase your game. So it's a really great way to A, meet people, B, develop skill sets, uh, C, get games for your portfolio if you don't have that, and D, I guess it's just really fun. Um, and it's fun to see how different minds work, how everyone is given the same theme and people create such vastly different things. So um, yeah, you should definitely join in on game, game jams. Sweet. Next one. Hi, Anna. Sorry if this has already been. What is the best way to learn more about UI UX and upskill oneself? 
As a recent game design graduate, the course didn't teach us as much as I'd hoped, so I was wondering what skills you should know and demonstrate in order to get to be ready and to start applying for junior positions. Um, so, oh, also Toronto, Canada. Yep, cool. Find game jams. I guarantee you there's game jams in Toronto. Uh, all right, so I actually did a UX design course with General Assembly, which was really, really good. Um, when it comes to UI, uh, all the like the graphic design stuff, I've got a degree in graph. Uh, that was basically where it started for me. You can do interaction design as well. Um, and on my ex did interaction design in Sweden, which was also super useful, which I wish now I'd also done. Um, but yeah, General Assembly, if you don't know if there's any great courses around you, they do offers as well. Um, that was great. They give you the, like the one-on-one courses, you know, one-on-one on UX design. And I learned so, so, so much. The thing about those online courses as well is that it's all about how much you put into them. So, I mean, you could just do the bare basics and not really gain that much or you could go all in and you really put your heart and soul into this course and i feel like i absolutely maximized it and it was great so um yeah general assembly is was my go-to and i can highly recommend them Any and yeah, what skills i should know and demonstrate in order to start um Get good at iterating. <laughs> Get good at um, scratching everything you do and starting over again. <laughs> um, I hate everything you do. I know this is a typical artist thing to, to say, but I think a friend of mine usually says it's not, she's, she's a, an artist and she says it's not finished until I hate it, um, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, you, you're going to constantly doubt yourself. You're gonna be, hate everything you make and you think you're not good enough and just don't doubt yourself. Just just roll with it. You're great. Everyone's great. You find your little niche that you're good at and just craft your absolute, like just, just do that. Um, and then, but again, don't, that, yeah, that, that and also not that. So find your little niche, but all this is gonna sound so contradictory, I'm sorry. Um, but also yeah. be well-rounded. Um, so I know that a lot of people get into like concept art, so they'll, they want to be 2D artists and they uh, found this one style that they're really good at drawing. But the fact is, when you work at a game studio, you're not going to be working in your own style. And as a concept artist, you're going to be expected to do so many different kinds of styles. So I guess while you should have a niche that you're good at, also practice doing things that you're not good at. So um, yeah, like that's the great thing about working on The Sims, that so many people have completely varied backgrounds. This isn't the kind of thing they would usually work on. So they bring that expertise from other areas and they bring it into this. Um, so yeah, just practice, practice, practice. Do lots of game jams, do um, even your own things, make your own things. Take, I think repeating what I said before as well, uh, take an app that is busted and, and make it better, redesign it. Um, I guess that's really good kind of stuff to have in your portfolio if you're applying for junior positions. Find something. A, What's is that? There, is there a particular type of like side project that can lend itself well to iteration? Like if if, it, if showing iteration is a strong suit, what kind of side projects are good for that and what kinds are not? For iteration, well, iteration is just um, about making things better. So everything that you do, you will iterate on. So, right. um, so it like do something very quickly don't put that much effort into it like just kind of gray box design something really quickly test it find the flaws and scratch it and redesign it again test it again find the flaws scratch it redo it again so anything that you're doing it right it's the only way you're going to improve I've, I've seen some people write some blog posts especially when it comes to game jam games uh where they just talk about how the how their game changed throughout the entire game jam so like they show yeah. gifts of the first drafts yeah what they learned it's so cool. yeah it's so interesting to see the before and afters of like hey this is where we started and this is what we ended up with yeah so i think like instagram was originally some like check-in app where people could oh, correct me if i'm wrong i'm probably totally wrong 
but like there are so many uh, big apps today where it started as something completely different and the use like your target audience was using it differently so they iterated and they changed it and eventually they got instagram which is something completely different to how it started and yeah the story of twitch is really funny it's like they started as a uh they had this idea of an of a site where people would stream everything all the time like stream someone's entire life and then yeah. they realized that games were the most popular and they, they went into that <laughs> yeah exactly exactly find what so so many ideas are great for the wrong reasons and people market them for the wrong reasons and then as you find out how people use them that's how i found what it's actually useful for another question would you also be involved in the <clears throat> Excuse me. In the tool creation games, and do you believe the mock pro- that mock projects should also be considered uh, portfolio entries? Um, yes. Yeah, so we are actually very much involved in the development of our layout that I mentioned before. Uh, a lot of the features that are in the tool are there because we've requested them. Uh, so, and we we're also the, the front line when it comes to bugs and things obviously because we're the ones who use it first so any bugs and any broken things we're the ones who report them and then get the the dev team the engine team to to fix that uh so oh, i say the engine team but it's also the the tool team it's the same team that works on the two uh the core team i guess you could say um so yeah so we're involved in that they don't know how to create the tool unless they know what the users need so we are the users with the target audience for this tool so it's up to us to um to tell them you know how can my work be streamlined how can my work be made easier in ui creation and ui animation you know what what things do i need in this tool? and so i think that's why we always fall back to using our own internal software instead of you know adobe xd or sketch or whatever because we've got an entire set of engineers here that can com- customize and create a completely unique tool for our particular needs um and so yeah so while i'm not directly on the team like i'm not you know writing the code for for this tool but we we are the teams that kind of tell them what we want from it and um yeah if you if you are a student and you have an actually on um, any big projects then yeah like your own mock projects are completely valid as portfolio. What recruiters are often looking for is your your skill. You know, they don't. Obviously, we care about your your experience. You know, what? How do you work with other people? But if you haven't done that, we also want to see your your talent. And if you can manifest that into a mock project, by all means, go for it. Yeah, I'm used to seeing a lot of interviews where they ask you about your process, like. Even if you have a mock interview, I mean, a mock project that you're showing off in your portfolio, they might ask you, what was it like to work on this? What were some of the changes you made over the course of the project? What did you learn from feedback? And being able to talk about that and elaborate on it is, I think, very important. Absolutely, 100%. And it's, again, it's about seeing the before and afters and how you iterated, how you grew as a developer as well. What did you learn? Because that's reflective of your skill set just as much as the visual final product is. I think your journey, my journey, anyone's journey, is just as important as the final product. So, so it's seven, it's time times up. By the way, do you have to go really quick, or do um, you have time for one more? I can, do, I can do. Yeah, I can do another one. Um, is there room to hire remote located UX designers for game companies, or do they prefer all staff in house? Uh, I can't speak for other game companies. Um, I, uh, we, we have someone in here. I have no idea how other people work. Um, I think actually, like it becomes a bit difficult. I'm sure that you can do it, but it becomes very difficult when you're working on, with a team because the UX designers have, excuse this, this metaphor now, but we've got our fingers in everyone's eye. Like we, we work with so many different parts of the team. Um, we work with the producers, we work with the designers, we work with the engineers, we work with the uh, UI people, we work with um, absolutely everyone, the animators. And so it becomes very difficult to have a day-to-day rapport and you know answer questions, find questions, and even find the problems that people aren't verbally like raising. 
something, you can see someone struggling with something, and you can't see that if you're not inside interacting with these people on a daily basis. Um, so I'm sure that some game companies can do that, um, but on a team that is working in live service, and especially one like ours where we're working on such a big scale, we definitely need people in-house that we can kind of chat to constantly. Thank you for your time. No worries. <laughs> I feel like there was a couple of questions back that I that I missed about A-B testing. And uh, yeah, there was questions four and five here. Um, I think I'll post very, the link very, to your very... Twitter in case people want to ping you on there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, we do A-B testing. Um, we've got analysts and product managers that do work with that. And our sprints are very long. We've got six week updates. So while we divide that into little sections, we kind of work in six week updates. So that was my quick, quick, quick answer. Ooh. Cool. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone for joining in. And um, Thank that you. was really fun. Thanks. Bye bye. So I made a I made a recording. I'll post it. Uh, something went wrong. I lost the first half hour. Oh no. But I'll, I'll, I'll post what I have. If anyone has a backup, Ian. Are you <laughs> cool. Um, Ian's, oh, Ian's got a backup as always. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great day. Have a good day. And for West Hemisphere people, have a good night. <laughs>